It sounds like a lot of you are already in business and selling. Is everybody here in business and selling currently? Okay. No, you're not. Okay, so you're, you're, yeah. So you guys can help her out with some of the stuff that you've learned along the way. Don't make the same mistakes, right? So that's why we like to do this as a, a cohort of companies. Um, so let me ask a few questions about where you guys are in, in, your, in your journey. Um, are all of you incorporated? Are all, have all of you, so yes, yes, not yet, not yet, yes, you're incorporated? You're, Ah, what, this is perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. So let's talk about that. That's going to be one of the first things that we cover. Um, and uh, just for, the, for some of you, this may be stuff you already know. For some of you, not. So um, why incorporate? So uh, until you incorporate, you're operating as a sole proprietorship. And you're probably using your personal bank account. Yes, no? I am an LLC. You're an LLC. OK, good, <laughs> good stuff. That is a form of incorporation. All right, so um, the reason you want to move from a sole proprietorship to some, some form of incorporated entity has to do with risk. So if you operate as a sole proprietorship, and, and especially if you're using your personal bank account and stuff like that, you can do that for a while, but you're at risk. So if, if you cause any harm to a customer, um, like you're in food, right? So let's say for some reason you make a bad batch and a customer gets sick, and you're, offer, you're operating as a sole proprietor, then your personal assets are at risk. So the reason... The reason you incorporate is to create a shield between yourself and a liability that might be created by the operation of your company, okay? It's that simple. Um, so uh, a lot of people ask me, well, when should I incorporate? And my answer is before you accept the first check from a customer, because at that point, you're beginning customer engagement and there's, there's potential liabilities and risks involved. And the other thing is, it's best if you have a separate bank account for your company that's separate from your personal bank account because you don't want to commingle funds. So a lot of startups don't do this. They start out you know, for the first six months or so kind of not incorporated as sole proprietorships and they're kind of using their personal funds in their personal bank account. That's not real clean record keeping and commingling personal and business funds creates accounting problems down the road, okay? So general principle there is you wanna be incorporated and try to avoid commingling personal funds with business funds, okay? So for example, let's say you're starting a business. So you know, you're starting a business you might want to open a, a business checking account and loan the company 500 bucks to get it started, all right? So that goes on the books as that company's owed back to you as a person independent of the company, right? So that's a good way to kind of start out, right? That, that way, um, you know, the, the corporation essentially does owe you that money back. It's, it's called an advance from the founder. So it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily a loan, but it's a cash advance from the founder. And you want to have a record of that. Because down the road, when you're making a lot of money, you want to pay yourself back. And there needs to be a record of that transaction both ways. What, what the money coming in was and what the money coming out is. All right, so there's different forms of incorporation. Um, Limited liability partnerships are de generally for professional services firms. So I'm a partner in an architectural firm, and we're a LLP, limited liability partnership. So that doesn't really apply here, all right? What does apply is limited liability corporation. 
So an LL, so somebody's an LLC. Who's the, you're an LLC, anybody else? Okay. Yeah, LLC is a good way to start um, because it is a form of incorporation and as an LLC, all of the profits and all of the losses flow through to the um, members' personal tax returns. Okay, so what that means is um, that you have the advantage of the corporate shield, but you also have the advantage of the, the pass through to your corporate, uh, to your personal uh, tax returns on profits and losses in the corporation. So the reason that's good is a lot of times when you're starting out, you lose money, okay? And that becomes a tax deduct deduction on your personal return. I am not an accountant, full disclaimer, uh, but if you, if you talk to your, you know, your tax attorney and your lawyer, that's why a lot of companies start out as LLCs for that pass-through on, on profits and losses. Um, an S corporation is very similar to a limited liability corporation. It allows the pass-through of profit and losses directly to the to the stockholders' uh, personal returns. So it has the, that same advantage. The difference is uh, its stock is issued to the owners of the company. Um, so in an LLC, you don't issue stock, you have a record of membership interest, which is pretty much the same thing as stock, right? So I I'm a, I'm participate in, uh, I think, seven or eight LLCs, and depending on how much cash you put in and what the arrangement is with the different people that are involved in the LLC, each one of those individuals will have a different membership interest percentage. If it's an S corporation, they might, you might form the corporation with, let's say, a thousand shares of stock, and then you issue the stock to the, to the founders of the company based on their percentage of contribution to the company or however they want to set it up. So an S corpus stock, LLC, is membership interest. Um, it's very easy to convert either of those forms of corporation to a C corp, okay? So, and, and again, I'm not an accountant, okay? So converting from an LLC to a C corporation, which it issues stock instead of membership interests, is real easy to do. Converting from an S corp to a C corp is even easier. Um, going from back to an S corp is really hard, okay? So once you, once you convert, you, it's hard to go backwards, all right? So let me explain just the general, gener, generalities around that. If your company can potentially scale up to a large enterprise, uh, you know, and I don't know how you guys define success. So each, each one of you is gonna have a different definition of success, right? Some of you might wanna make $100,000. Some of you might wanna make a million dollars. Some of you might wanna build your company into, you know, 100 million. So I don't know what your definition of financial success might look like here, but if you're going to scale your company into a large entity with uh, large amounts of uh, revenue and large amounts of capital, frequently you're gonna need uh, outside investors to invest in the company to allow that growth to occur, and you're gonna need to issue a lot of shares. Okay, so this is why almost all public, all public companies are C-Corps. So everything that's traded on the stock exchanges as, or NASDAQ or whatever, they're all C-Corporations because only a C-Corporation can issue large amounts of stock. An S-Corporation is restricted to a certain number of stockholders, whereas a C-Corp, you can have as many stockholders as you want. So when when we're working with a startup company that is potentially scalable into a large enterprise, we'll frequently tell them, hey, just start out as an LLC. You can convert to a C Corp later on when you want to engage with investors, okay? 
Um, but you will have to convert to a C corporation if you're going to get uh, large amounts of outside capital from investors uh, because they're going to want to have an equity interest in the company. They're going to want stock in return for them giving you your capital. So C corporation typically applies to uh, scalable business entities that can grow into fairly large corporations. Um, this applies to licensing and franchising, okay? So uh, really any of you, if you develop a really cool brand with a really awesome business model, um, you could potentially scale that business into a large enterprise by licensing the brand to others to, you know, so this is like Krispy Kreme donuts, right? So Krispy Kreme Donuts has a certain number of company-owned stores, and then they have tons of franchisees, people that buy into the brand and operate the local donut store and make a nice living doing that, right? But Krispy Kreme scaled out into a very large corporate entity, so it's, it's a C corporation, so that it can issue lots of stock to those franchisees, license holders. So, um, so C Corp kind of applies to uh, uh, a scalable business that's going to take outside investment. It applies to franchising. It applies to licensing deals if you're going to scale out through licensing. <clears throat> so each of you want to, you know, you want to be comfortable in your skin, in your own skin. You know, don't try to do, you know, don't try to be Elon Musk if you're not Elon Musk, right? So each of you ha probably has a certain level of ambition, a certain level of you know, vision for your company, and you've got to figure out what that is. Um, and you may move through different forms of incorporation depending on what your journey looks like. Any questions on that stuff? Whew, I really beat that dead, didn't I? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, OK. Another kind of basic principle is you want to protect your company. Um, the thing that's most valuable with any company is the intellectual capital of the company, all right? Um, and that includes copyrights and trademarks, which a lot of times people don't think about. A lot of times when people talk about IP, it's like the science or the software co code uh, or uh, what have you. Um, but intellectual property applies to the, your brand. So Flywheel, uh, I use myself in, as, as an example here. Flywheel, the primary value of Flywheel is our brand. We deliver a brand experience for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of capital assets per se, but we have a lot of uh, capital asset in our brand, all right? We, we spent, you know, the last eight years building the brand. Um, so it's really important to us to protect that brand. Um, and that's where trademarks come into play. I'm, we'll talk about copyrights in a minute, but uh, one lesson I can give you, like, right off the start is when you name your company, make sure you do a thorough uh, search on the internet for uh, domain availability and also for potential conflicts with, with the trademark of the name. Naming a company is really hard. Okay, now the reason why you want to pay attention to naming your company properly is if you get way down the road and you got a website, you got a huge community of followers that loves your brand and all that kind of stuff, and one day you open a letter that comes in the mail that says, you must cease and desist using that name. Uh, that's a bad day. And that's happened to a number of our companies that we've worked with over the years. Uh, so, and, and it, so another company that has the same name as you, even if they're in a completely different market sector, like. Uh, what's the name of your company? 
Okay, uh, let's say there's a Christie's cruising creations that's in the cruise industry. Completely different industry. Or cruise and creations, even in, without the Christie. If, that, if, if it's a big company with a lot of financial resources, they're gonna send you a cease and desist letter. And say, stop using that name, it's too close to our brand. We don't want you anywhere near our brand, okay? And you can't fight it. Um, even though it, it seems completely unfair and unjust, if they're a much bigger entity with better financial resources and they want you to cease and desist, you're gonna, you're gonna have to change the name of your company. And if you've already made a lot of investments in building your brand, it's really painful. It's really hard to change uh, you know, after three or four years of developing a brand. So this is really important, pay attention to it. Um, you, you can get a long ways down the road just by doing internet searches and also checking out domain names. You know, so uh, it's really hard to come up with a great new name because they're all taken, <laughs> right? So when you check out the domain names, if, 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 if they're totally taken, across the board, including .net, and .io, and .biz, and all that kind of stuff, then there's likely a lot of company players that could be potentially a conflict with you down the road, okay? So uh, you can do an internet search. The best thing to do is to hire a trademark attorney. It costs about 500 bucks. And they will do, they will, no trademark attorney will tell you whether or not your trademark, your your trademark is free and clear in the marketplace, but they will tell you the probability of you being able to protect your trademark. They won't, they won't tell you hard and fast, you know, you're, you're good to go, great name, run with it. They'll tell you that there's very little competition out there. Uh, and what these people do is they search all the registered trademarks and all of the non-registered trademarks that are, in, that are active in the marketplace and they'll come back and give you an opinion. They'll say, you know, uh, you might want to consider changing your name or you're pretty good to go, but here's three companies that might be a problem. Uh, or they'll say, you know, we didn't, really didn't find any issues. Uh, they'll never say for sure that you're free and clear because they don't want that to come back to Ohana. But they'll give you a probability of how free and clear your, the name of your company is. Okay. So what can be copyrighted? This is really important. Like for you, you you've got recipes. You're making things with recipes. Uh, you can copyright the recipes if they're original recipes. Okay. If they're you know if you didn't get the recipe from somebody else's cookbook or whatever, uh, you can copyright recipes. You can copyright songs. You can copyright formulas. So if some of you guys that are doing like uh, personal care products and beauty products and so forth, if you have a completely original formulation, you can copyright it. And you wanna put the copyright on the label and all, on all of your communication. Um, and in, uh, so content, so blog posts, uh, if you wrote an original article on your website and it's a blog post, put copyright at the bottom, copyright, you know, 20, what, what is this year, 2022? <laughs> you know, and that, that means that original content creation that you've developed is you own. So if somebody picks it up and copies you, you can call them out and say, that's copyrighted material. You can't use that without uh, my authorization or without paying me, all right? So that's a really good practice, uh, particularly on your media, like we'll talk about this when we get into the marketing class, but one of the things you want to do is build a big following through your social media channels and, you know, with uh, really good management of your website. And if you're writing original stuff, copyright it, all right? And that, that helps protect your brand, it helps protect your materials. <clears throat> In some cases, software code can be copyrighted. The, the uh, and in some cases, software code can be patented. Uh, that is a really tricky area, so I don't think any of you guys are planning on developing 
blockchain software or you know a whole new app or anything like that. So we don't re need to go into that. Um, okay, other forms of intellectual property. Uh, you may want to patent what you're working on. So all of you guys are working on physical products, right? <clears throat> um, there may be an opportunity to protect that product with a patent. Now, getting a patent is expensive. Filing for a provisional patent is not expensive and protects you uh, while the patent is being considered by the patent office, which typically takes a couple of years. So if your product is pretty original, not derivative, uh, and you want to protect it with a patent, you might want to consider that. And you're going to want to talk to a patent attorney. Okay? So uh, filing for a provisional patent is not that expensive in the general scheme of things. <laughs> but getting a full patent protection is very expensive, particularly if, if you're going to go international. Um, you're, you're getting into tens of thousands, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars for patent protection. So you got to you kind of got to measure the investment against the risk, right? <clears throat> um, but you may want to consider filing at least for a provisional patent if you've got kind of uh, an innovative original creation that you don't want to be copied by anybody else. Um, <clears throat> now, what you can do for free and you need to do to protect your business is to have proprietary information and confidentiality clauses in all of your agreements, okay? Including your bylaws. Or if you're an LLC, uh, in your operating agreement for the LLC. And basically what the proprietary information clause says is that the, the proprietary information of this company belongs to the company, not to the founders and not to any individuals that work for the company. It stays with the company. <clears throat> the reason that's really important is that's the, that's the entire value of the company. Without protection of your intellectual property, somebody else can rip you off, copy what you're doing, uh, you know, and uh, basically steal a lot of the effort that you put into your stuff. So starting with your bylaws or your operating agreement, you want to introduce language that says the, the original creations, the intellectual capital that goes into this product and this brand belongs to the company. <clears throat> and that includes, like, if you have more than one founder, you want to have a co-founder agreement that states the relate, do, do any of you guys have partners or co-founders? Okay, so if you get a partner or a co-founder, you're gonna wanna have an agreement that states what your relationship is with that founder that includes the proprietary and confidentiality clauses, okay, to protect the company. <clears throat> and then finally, and this is really important because most of you are gonna have vendor agreements uh, consultant agreements and contracts uh, and make sure that you have confidentiality clauses and proprietary information clauses in all of those agreements, okay? Because it's not unusual for vendors to rip, to rip you off. Like if, for example, who's, who's doing the, um, like the personal care products, like the creams and all that kind of stuff, like if you, if you have a pretty cool original formula and <clears throat> you uh, subcontract out the production, you know, let's say you scale up and you wanna sub out the production and the packaging, um, you don't want that vendor to rip your creation off. So you wanna have these things in those vendor agreements. That's, that's when you talk to an attorney, right? You just need to know that that matters that those things need to be in your, and that, that all has to do with protect your brand, protect your trademark, copyright if that's appropriate, um, maybe pursue a patent if, if it's important to the company, but definitely have those clauses in your agreements with vendors 
and consultants. Okay. I did have a question before yeah. you go on. So you were saying, okay, I get the whole trademark, but copyright, do you need to seek an attorney in order to do your copyright no. too? No, just put copyright. Copyright, the name of your business, and the year. Now, when you get, if you start making a whole lot of money, you're going to hire a lawyer to look at your copyrights and ask if you need to do something more specific or more detailed. But for now, just copyright your stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question for you. So I, have a, I do have a vendor for my products. Uh -huh. Now I feel like I'm ripping her off. So I just got to make sure I'm not ripping her off. She's in Africa, right? Yeah. So I tell her what I want. She gives me the product. I pay her. Yeah. Do I still need like some type of agree written agreement with her? It would be good to have a vendor ag agreement. You know, maybe not now. Is it just we're, you know, verbal between you and her? That, that's fine for a period of time, but eventually you're going to want to get more formal. There needs to be an actual written agreement. You know, for example, I have an agreement with you, the vendor, in, your vendor's in Nigeria, right? Correct. Um, that you will produce X amount of product using this formula, you know, under, you know, these terms and conditions, and here's, here's when I need it, and the quantity I need it in, and you're going to want to have some sort of contract with that entity. Sidebar, do you write these type of things out? Or no, you no. You, uh, <laughs> you go to an ad <laughs> Well, the answer is yes, kind of. So you can, uh, f there's a lot that can be accomplished on a website called clerky.com, uh, which has all organizational documents and, you know, incorporating in Delaware. There's reasons to incorporate in Delaware. How many of you are incorporated in Delaware? None. How many of you are incorporated in North Carolina? That's okay. I mean, that's all right. When you say incorporated in North Carolina, like you mean like if we have the LLC and we've registered with the state of North Carolina? State of North Carolina. You've registered your business with the state of North Carolina. Right. Now, every, you, you know, you could be doing business in Georgia and you have to register your business there, but it's where, it's the state in which you incorporated. Uh, and you had to file a form with the Secretary of State to become incorporated. So that's where you're incorporated. North Carolina has fairly clean case law. Delaware has the best case law in the country, which is why a lot of companies incorporate in Delaware, by the way. Um, just something to think about. The, uh, so there, you know, there's LegalZoom, there's lots of these websites. The problem with taking that approach to your legal matters is the websites don't always consider the particularities of the state in which you're incorporated. So don't go too far down the road with boilerplate stuff. I mean, I do some boilerplate stuff that I rip off you know, similar stuff on the internet or I go to LegalZoom or whatever, if it's relatively low risk. But if, if it's more important to the company, I always have an attorney. I always go to my attorney. Okay? Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right, so are we ready to move on? Feel free to answer, ask questions at any time. Otherwise, I will just talk. Uh, so, you guys are relatively early in the development of your businesses. How long have you been going? Three years. Three years. It's been like a decade. A but decade. I've been around for a long time. Okay. <laughs> Two years. About a year. About a year. Two years. Three years. Seven months. Seven months. Three months. Three months. One year. One year. Okay. So this may, some of this stuff may not apply so much to you guys. I'm going to find out, though. Uh, but it will apply to the earlier companies. You know, if, you're, if you've been in business two years or less, most of what I'm going to talk about here is going to apply. Um, no matter what kind of business you are, uh, the most successful businesses have very deep customer relationships, okay? And as the founder of your company, you cannot 
offload that onto somebody else. It's the founder that needs to talk to the customers. It's the founder that needs to get customer insights and learn what the customers really want. <clears throat> um, even 20 years from now, you know, after, after your business is a resounding success and you've got, you know, a couple hundred employees, including a sales department, as the founder of the company, you still want to talk to your customers. You never want to stop that conversation because the founder has to set the vision for the company and the vision needs to be grounded in what the customers want and how the customers want to be served. If you ever stray from that, your, your likelihood of failing is pretty high, okay? Um, so the worst thing you can do as an early stage company is say, I hate selling, I'm gonna go hire a salesperson. Um, the, because salespeople don't have the vision that you have for your company, and they don't care as much about customer insights that you know, might, a customer might just basically say, look, I hear what you're telling me, I understand what you're trying to sell me, but this is what I really want. Okay, so a salesman's just gonna walk out the door and go on to the next customer. But, but there's an insight there that only the founder can understand and is of value to the founder. So don't make the mistake of offloading sales to somebody else until your company is pretty well established and you really feel like you, you know and understand the customers that you're serving, all right? So this whole idea of lean startup practices has to do with um, making the most out of your money, your monetary resources, and your time, which are the two primary resources an early stage company has, right? Uh, well, I don't wanna speak for all of you, but do any of you have like multi-million dollar capital behind you to, to fuel your launching of your company, right? You don't have a lot of money, and you, only, you, know, you only have a certain amount of time in the day. Founders tend to burn pretty hard, burn the candle pretty hard. But at some point, you can only put so much personal energy into a, launching a business or building a business. So you've got to be very careful about, um, about how you manage your money and how you manage your time uh, to be successful in business. Um, and you also got to be very careful about how you manage the equity in your company. So if you're an LLC, you can get capital by bringing in investors and giving them a membership interest in the company, but you want to be very careful about how you parse that out. Uh, you don't want to lose control of your company by giving too much equity to others, right? Whether it's a, a corporation or a, a C Corp or an S Corp or an LLC, whatever. Um, so what lean startup practices have to do with is how do you get from your ideas to repeatable revenue and market traction as quickly as possible, all right? And the key to this is uh, you may think you know how to do that, but you don't. Um, because the number one problem most founders have is they think they know. They love their product, right? You guys love your product. And people like your product. So you think you know exactly what you need to do. The fact of the matter is, it's the customers that know what you need to do, okay? So this is a really important concept. You are not the customer. I'll say it again. You are not the customer. The customer is outside this building somewhere um, and it's important for that customer to tell you what they want, how they want it delivered, what kind of features they would like. So the whole idea here is the most important thing you can do is go through what's called customer discovery uh, and customer validation. And you never stop doing this, okay? In the early days, it's super important because it's, it's these customer engagements that help you get, uh, build confidence that you, you're, you know what, you know, you're not making an assumption, you're not guessing 
what the customers want because they have told you what they want. <clears throat> and typically it's different from what you think. All right? So we're going to talk about how you do that. How do I go figure out what the customers want? How do I go figure out who the customers are you know, for my product? <clears throat> and then how do I engage with them in a way that they actually tell me what they want, how they want it delivered, how much they're willing to pay, um, those kind of things, right? So this is really, really valuable, critical information to get to as fast as possible to, to orient your company properly. So that's called customer discovery and validation. And we'll talk about how you, how you do that. <clears throat> so all of you guys are solving a problem of some kind because customers are willing to pay for your product or service. All right, so let's, let's work on that a little bit together. What problem are you solving for your customers? Um, being able to provide natural products that can give you the benefits that you need without having all these synthetic chemicals and added processing and all that stuff, which pretty much strips the naturalness away. And then you're left with stuff that gives you problems with your skin, your health, okay. and your body. All right, so, and basically your products have to do with beauty or? Not so much beauty, it's just about maintaining like a healthy body, I guess you would say. Like we have stuff that like the teas are good for certain things as far as your right. body. And the soaps, the, the ingredients in the soaps right. help to benefit skin conditions, things like that, instead okay. of like going to buy a bar soap from the store. Right, with a lot of chemical additives right. and that kind of thing. So you, the, one of the key underlying assumptions of your business is that customers care about that. So let's, let's, let's keep moving around the table. Cer certain customers, that's right. So that gets into certain types of customers care about that, certain customer demographics care about that, and you gotta figure out who they are, what are those segments, how old are they, what, you know, what's their racial makeup, what's their ethnic background, what's their, uh, where do they live ge geographically, and most importantly, how do they think? What, are they, what do they think? You know, when is the right moment to, to, to position the product under the proposition that this product is healthier for you because it's all natural? When's the right moment to deliver that message to the specific customer segment that's gonna be your champions, right? Yeah. Right. Now, there's a lot of assumptions there that you wanna test as you move through developing your business. And you can do that scientifically, and we're going to talk about that. So what problem are you solving? So what I did mention earlier is part of my business is also attached to wear, and specifically concealed carry wear for women. Um, me as a customer, um, before I create women, so I wanted to buy fashionable but functional uh, women's concealed carry wear, and I really couldn't find that in the styles I was looking for. I really found the sort of niche market uh, for my business. So for me, I'm going to carry more as a black or tactical pants. I'm going to carry leggings, sports bras, like something that's actually fashionable that women actually right. want to feel confident in uh, carrying concealed like them. Right. Do you know how, how many women actually possess weapons? Uh, I saw, if I did do research on that, I saw yeah. that I believe, um, let's see, 18% of North Carolina have their concealed carry permit. Okay. So you've, you've got a really beautiful thing there in terms of a very, so females, um, that are concerned about their safety and are motivated to carry, carry a weapon as a result to, to make them more secure. So you've got a real very defined customer segment and a very defined customer argument, customer uh, makeup that's gonna make it much easier for you to do your testing. So she's got a, a much narrower customer profile than maybe you do. What, what's your customer look like? I think mine is very broad as well. It's very similar to hers. Well, let's, t let's stick with the problem piece. What problem are you solving? Same problem. Uh, vanity and health 
in regards to the products that I'm selling, um, knowing that there is a difference between all natural and undiluted products versus, yeah. say, shea butter, which for coconut butter and oils that you're going to get from Tyson across the street. Right. There's a huge difference. And realizing that some of those products help um, certain disorders, such as, you know, rosacea, skin disorders, right. arthritis, right. depending on how you use these products. So that's so, so the intersection of vanity and health and uh, maybe some uh, targeted products that, that do specific things around skin irritation and things of that nature, okay? What problem are you solving with your business? Um, home decor. So I help busy women decorate their homes for the seasons or for entertaining the holidays. <laughs> okay. Is it a consultancy? No, I'm like, I sell signs. So like, that's the problem I solve, but it would be like, okay. they want to decorate, but they don't know how. Right. So I offer that. So you, you help folks accessorize their, their space, and you make it easy for them to do yeah. that. Yeah, I guess a lot of my social media is like, how to, how to decorate it, and then we have the products to use. What about you? What problem are you solving? Um, Get some an actual gift or product personalized as far as going to Walmart or Target is buying. Ah. So it's it's more local and personal than a lot of the mass market options. And the what the trigger for the buyer is they want to give somebody a gift. Yes. Is that right? For the most part, yes. For the most part. <laughs> We can work on this. I mean, you are going to work on this. It, this is really useful, guys, to, to, to um, get more and more and more defined about what problem you're actually solving. What is the pain point that you're taking away f f on behalf of your customer? In a, in a lot of ways, early stage companies, it's like playing the hot potato game, all right? So the hot potato is a problem, right? It's like... Here, take this hot potato. I don't want this hot potato. It's burning my hands. So, I, and you're going to tell me, give me that hot potato. I'll manage that hot potato for you for $5 a month, right? And that's the, that's the problem solution fit. You're trying, to, I, you're trying to kind of come up with a really laser specific definition of the the problem that you're solving for a specific customer set and that you can prove that you're the solution fit. And you're the better solution fit than anybody else out there. You've got a unique value proposition, you've got a competitive advantage that makes your hot potato relief service better than everybody else, right? And we're gonna get better at better at this. So what's, what problem are you solving? Right. So these are confections, right? Artistic confections. And they're personalized. Um, we do a lot of themed cakes. So yeah. um, if you are having a party and yeah. you want to do like a sports team, a specific sports team, yeah. like Sylvia was saying, rather than just buying something at Publix, you know, yeah. um, we can personalize it to a specific theme or color right. um, that goes along with all the street yeah. tables. Yeah, so you'll have a real interesting customer discovery journey, right? Because I'm like, I'm a business. You can make probably confections that have the flywheel logo on it, mm -hmm. and I could give that to all my customers. That would be a B2B relationship. Or you can sell them to you know, consumers that want to have a birthday party with a really unique confection, right? Yes. So that's, that makes your job a little bit harder than some of these other guys, because you're going to have to figure out which channel is the best, and you know, is it B two B? Is it is it business to business, or is it business to consumer? Who is your optimal customer, right? And also, what's your definition of success? Like, if 
it may be that your definition of success is not selling to businesses, that you want to focus on individuals and really focus on that high degree of personalization and have a more intimate individual relationship with your customer. We would like to expand. Um, one of my ideas to her was to um, do like with uh, realtors, you know, as gifts to their home buyers, um, to, as, a, as a treat, as a welcoming home, or, you know, as being maybe a first home buyer. Um, that realtor giving their, their client. Realtors love that stuff. Yeah. I get an email like yes. every other month from my realtor with a gift. <laughs> they love that kind of stuff. What's your, what problem are you solving? So it was, um, it was interesting that you mentioned listening to your customer um, and let them tell you the problem. Right. I feel like over the years, the problem has changed. So it started as right. a personalized gift um, that they couldn't get at Target or Walmart right, right. for bridal showers, baby showers. Right. Oh my gosh, I have an event tomorrow. Yeah. Can you put somebody's name on it? You know, that sort of thing. Right. And then it moved um, more specifically in the last couple of years to being quarantined. So now people aren't going out. So then I started doing DIY kits for girls' nights so they could paint at home. So you pivoted to, uh, yes. and you listened to what your customers were right. telling you they wanted. Mm -hmm. And then like people who've lost family members during COVID, you know, being able to preserve yeah. their handwriting by having it engraved on items, that sort of thing, um, has definitely been um, a big thing for me and yeah. We, uh, similar experience with my company that I can share with you guys. So we're, we operate innovation centers and the innovation centers activate when there's a lot of people in them. So COVID hits, you know, and by law, you know, facilities shut down. So I, I will never forget the staff meeting that I had with my staff saying, we have to completely change our business. Uh, we are now in the publishing business, we're in the media business, and we're in the digital experience business for the, net, for the foreseeable future. So forget everything that was on your, you know, your, your goals for the next you know, six months. We're throwing all that in the trash can. We, gotta do, we have to operate completely differently. So you're right. Conditions change and you gotta be flexible and adaptable. And if, if, you're, if you don't really have your ear to the ground with your customers as a founder, you can miss those signals and, and your business. That's why businesses die, right? So this is, uh, the businesses go through a natural life cycle just like human beings do. They, they, they start, they grow, and they die. They all do, eventually. Um, you may be interested to know that large corporations are in the job destruction business. But large corporations, by and large, are shedding jobs on an annual basis. All of the job growth in the United States is coming from entrepreneurs like you that are starting new businesses and adding jobs to the pipeline. Almost all of the employment growth in the United States is coming from businesses that are less than five years old. Isn't that amazing? Almost all of it. What's your problem? What problem are you solving? So I think I've uh, kind of been able to fill a gap in the area, you know, as far as the repair goes. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a couple big box stores in the area that do, you know, kind of do in-house repairs, small things, um, and they don't really want to take on big jobs or like big restoration type things. Right. And so, you know, somebody that has a, you know, 50s, you know, less polish, something like that, they want to take and have it restored, you know, they're not going to take it to the guitar center. Right. Because, you know, but not. So, so they want to take it to a craftsman right. so that respects the doing. And, and that's yeah. really kind of, uh, there's not many people around, especially this area, that, that do things like that. So. Right. Again, you've got a fairly narrow customer set uh, that's relatively easy to identify and target with with media and 
build a following around and all that kind of stuff. All right, so thanks for sharing that with me. You should be asking yourself that question pretty fr frequently. What problem am I really solving for my customers? Um, once you feel like you've identified the problem space properly, which we're going to talk about, and you've got confirmation from customers that the solution you're offering is a fit, okay? The next question is, can, you, can it sell, okay? You don't have traction with your company until you have product market fit. And what that means is there, need to be, uh, there needs to be a large enough customer base that recognizes that problem solution fit, that's willing to pay for your product at a level that allows you to achieve profitability and matches your definition of success, right? That is what's called product market fit. Is there a big enough market? Is the market growing? Can you access the market? What percentage of the market can you uh, market share can you achieve? What's reasonable? Over what period of time? That's all the product market fit conversation. So that comes after pr problem solution fit because once the customers tell you, hey, this is a really good fit, I love what you're doing, you know, uh, then you gotta figure out, well, what's the revenue model? How much can I charge them? How do I deliver it? All that kind of stuff. And once that revenue starts flowing, it's like, okay, how big is the market? How many customers can I get? Um, because that affects your unit economics. It affects your level of profitability, the cost of customer acquisition, all those kind of things that we'll talk about in a little more detail. Are we okay here? Am I losing anybody? Okay. All right, so that's, that's the background. Uh, here's, here's the meat. All right, so here's how you go through customer discovery and customer validation. Um, lean customer development by Cindy Alvarez and value proposition design. Those are the two best books you can find on this subject. Now these books are kind of oriented towards the tech space. And I know you guys are not tech startups, but the principle, all of these principles apply. Okay. If you're doing, if you're wanting to explore a problem space, here's, here's how the scientific method works. If you want to explore a problem space with a set of customers, you need to interview five customers, that's all, just five. Um, and you want to interview them in a way where you're capturing data that's going to be consistent across all of your customer interviews. So you want to ask them all the same question. Same question, right? Um, if you're exploring a problem space, so you're not, you're not designing a product yet. You're just trying to figure out what's the friction that these customers are experiencing? What is their hot potato that I can take away from them? Okay? So uh, what these are called customer discovery interviews. And there's a specific way that you do this that's in Cindy Alvarez's book. I think it's on page 42. Um, and it's, it's a set of like five or six questions that you take them through uh, around the problem space. Now, what I mean by the problem space is you're not offering a solution yet. You're trying to discover how they deal with the problem that you intend to solve, okay? So um, the best way to do this is to set up cohorts of around five interviews that are a specific uh, age, ethnic, geographic, and psychographic background, all right? So you might say, I'm, we'll, we'll pick on you. <laughs> so I wanna discover uh, how musicians are dealing with instrument repair. Is that, did I say that right? Yeah. So the problem is, there's a lot of musicians out there that have invested in instruments, some quite a large investment, and they wanna take care of that instrument. It's, it's like 
extremely important to them, very emotionally attached, so on and so forth. So you might want to, um, you know, interview five Les Paul, five uh, 30-year-old male Les Paul guitar owners, <laughs> okay? And what you would talk to them about is um, uh, something along these lines. You would say, uh, um, how are you? I'm working on st starting a company, or I'm working on building a company. And uh, I'm, we're really interested in uh, how people get their instruments repaired. Is that a problem for you? Have you ever experienced difficulty getting your instrument repaired? Okay, if they say no, the interview's over. If they say yes, then you say, well, tell me, what was that like for you? How did you try to get it repaired? So what you're exploring there is competitive alternatives. How did you try to get the instrument repaired? And then uh, they said it was a problem, so you want to find out what what the problem was, what, what problem did they actually, so maybe they had to travel 100 miles to get it repaired. Or maybe they had to pay more than they wanted to to get it repaired. Or maybe the repair sucked, you know. Um, the way in which the repair was done was, was not good. I apologize for using that word. Uh, so you're asking kind of general questions about what was it like for you in dealing with that problem. And what happens is they give you insights that stuff you didn't maybe think about is like, oh, wow, um, I can really kill it within a 100-mile radius because they hate going that far to get their instruments repaired. So maybe I should concentrate on 30-year-old male Les Paul guitar owners that live within a 100-mile radius of my shop. That's a hypothesis, all right? And the way you would test that hypothesis is you would inter interview five more male Les Paul guitar owners that live outside the 100-mile radius. And if they say, no, I'm not interested because you're too far away, then you have scientifically validated that your customers are within that 100-mile radius. That's how you do it. And you keep doing it with cohorts. So the next thing you would do is, interview five female 30-year-old Les Paul guitar owners and find out if their experience is different from the males. Then you would start interviewing some baby boomer, boomers, right? Because there's probably more baby boomers that own Les Pauls than, than younger people. You know, so you want to you wanna kind of check through uh, you know, all of these, all this demographic data and have them explain to you what the problem is, what the problem was. And uh, then you can start asking questions like, well, how much did you pay for that bad experience? You know? And was that amount of money a problem or not? You know, was that the heart of the problem? So this is how you find out what your customers are thinking and what they want, all right? So it's called customer discovery. The, so the key to this is, you're not talking about your product. Do not talk about your product in these interviews. You're talking about the problem that the customers are experiencing. And this applies to all of you, okay? So tell me about the problem. How have you tried to fix it? Competitive alternatives. Um, what was that like? What did you like about it? And what did you hate about it? And here's the final question that's uh, the most important. If you could wave a magic wand and make that problem go away, what would that be like? That's, that's where you get the most insight information is when they answer that question. It's like, oh man, I wish I could just, you know, uh, I wish there was a secure way to ship my Les Paul guitar to you so I didn't have to travel at all. You know, so maybe the key to your business is secure shipping. You know, but you don't know that until you go through this kind of scientific methodology of exploring the problem space that your customers are experiencing so that you can, you can fine tune 
your product and you can fine tune the delivery of the product and the services associated with it to, to address exactly what they're telling you. And then people will, they'll pay you because you're taking care of the hot potato. Does that make sense? So the, the problem that most fa founders have is they think they know, the, they know what the problem is and they know what the solution is. But that doesn't matter because you're not gonna pay for your own product. You're not your customer. Your customer is outside the building. You'll hear quite a lot the phrase, get out of the building and go talk to customers. And that's, that's a discipline that you as business owners and founders should adhere to all the time. It doesn't matter what's in your head, it's what matters is what's in your customer's head. And you gotta discover them in terms of customer segments, what their makeup is, because once you discover that and they give you insights, then you can specifically target your marketing to where they live, how they get information, what they wanna hear. You know, you can show up at just the right moment. Your brand can appear right in front of them at just the right moment, right before that birthday or right before the anniversary. That's really inf easy information to get, right? So if, if your customers are, let's say your customers uh, turn out to be the most uh, uh, important segment for you turns out to be young moms that have a lot of birthdays going on and parties and stuff. And, uh, and you know that they're gonna wanna invest in confections of some kind. You just got, you gotta show up at just the right time, right when they're, right when they're thinking about buying, which is probably a week before the birthday. <laughs> right? And there's ways to do that in terms of both marketing and your e-commerce strategies. It's, it's largely about showing up at the right place at the right time in front of the right set of customers, okay? Value proposition design is part of this process, okay? So you need to offer a unique value to your customers to optimize the amount of money that they're willing to pay right? The, the more unique the value is and the hotter that potato is, the more they're going to pay. And you don't want to undercut yourself by setting your pricing too low. It is not a good business strategy to be the low cost provider in any market. That's a quick way to go out of business, right? Um, so part of the customer discovery and validation process is finding out what that, what that payment, <coughs> payment bandwidth is and it may be different for different customer demographics. So you might customize your pricing depending on who you're addressing with your marketing and who you're addressing at any given time. You know, look at Uber and their surge pricing, right? See, you know, that's a, that's a negative example, but um, you may determine that you can make more money by customizing your pricing for different customer segments and different types of deli product delivery. All right, but at, at the end of the day, um, you have to deliver value to a customer for them to pay, right? So the value we're delivering here at the Cabarrus Center is not just the space, not just the furniture and the infrastructure and the, inter the high bandwidth internet. We're surrounding entrepreneurs with lots of resources and lots of love. We love you guys, <laughs> right? That's part of our unique value proposition. If you go downtown to WeWork in Charlotte, which is a co-working space, you're just a number. Here, you're an entrepreneur, we love you, and we surround you with resources, so it's a very different experience. Our unique value proposition at the Cabarrus Center, operated by Flywheel, is that you become part of a community that cares about you and wants you to be successful. And we're literally, we will go to great lengths to make, to help you be successful, right? And you don't get that at most co-working spaces. So that's a, that's a real differentiator and a real unique value proposition that, that helps drive our business. So you gotta figure out what your secret sauce is and what your unique value proposition is. You know, you don't wanna make confections the way other, you know, everybody else is doing it. You want it to be unique and the experience 
of the whole experience of like ordering it, you know, making it exciting to order and how it's delivered. And then that moment when you put that thing in your mouth and it just completely changes you, you know, for in that moment, you know, that, that, that whole customer journey, customer experience is part of your unique value proposition. Same thing with you, like how the, you know, how the product arrives, the kind of package that it's in, how the packaging speaks to the customer. And then when you, you know, I don't know if you dip your, do you dip your stuff? Not really. When you dip, <laughs> you know, what does that feel like? What's the sensation, you know? Those are all parts of, that could be part of your unique value proposition. So you could be delivering uh, the exact same product as somebody else, the exact same formula as somebody else. Uh, and and that, that is completely irrelevant to your brand. The, br the brand is about the total experience, not just the formula, right? So that's, that might be part of your unique value proposition. I need to pick on somebody else here. So I'll, I'll pick on you. Um, you know, the, you're in a space where people want to be secure. They want to be comforted. Um, and you can build a brand around that, and you can build kind of really unique design differentiation in terms of how the stuff's designed and sewn and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's part of your journey is to figure out what that unique value proposition is. <clears throat> So all of this work has to do with talking to customers. Okay, now, most startups fail. You're not going to. Um, the reason most startups fail is because they never find market traction. They don't find product market fit. That's the number one reason companies fail. It's not because they couldn't get financing. It's not because they didn't work really hard. It's because there was no market. Or they didn't find the market. They didn't find, they didn't go through this discovery process, find the right customers. And again, I want to emphasize, it's basic scientific method. You have a hypothesis that you need to test. You set up interviews with cohorts of five customers with different makeups until you achieve a factual answer that yes, this is what the customers want. And, and they've given you insights and then you test those insights. So it's this use of the scientific method to, <clears throat> to take all the guesswork out. You wanna eliminate all the guesswork. It's, it, you want it to all be based in fact that the customers, the facts the customers have given to you about what they want and how they want it delivered and all that kind of stuff, okay? And I can't emphasize that enough. This is scientific method. Every, every one of your businesses has probably over 100 key assumptions, all right? And uh, what keeps owners and founders up at night is wondering whether those assumptions are actually true. <laughs> you know, are, are there really, really that many customers out there to support my revenue goals? Um, are they really willing to pay that much for uh, the type of repair that I'm delivering? You know, those are all assumptions on your part. Um, and the more you drive assumptions out of your business and base it in facts that the customers have given you, the more successful you're gonna be, right? Is this boring, is this okay? You guys learning stuff here? Okay, should I keep going? Okay, how many of you have written business plans? Raise your hand if you've written a business plan. What did you do with the business plan? You threw it out the window. What did you do with your business plans? You've kept it, so you're, you're still, that's a live document for you. What about you, what'd you do with your business plan? Okay, so I'm gonna 
make a recommendation to all of you that you don't need to write a business plan until you're seeking investment or a loan. That's when you've got to write a business plan. What you want is something much more lively and flexible, which we call a business model canvas. And the assignment, did you guys do the assignment in the first week by any chance? <laughs> okay, well you need to do the assignment. So there's, uh, in the first, on the learning management system, at the end of the concepts, there are two assignments. Um, and I want you guys to learn about business model canvas. Because essentially what this is, is it's all the ingredients that end up going into a business plan. But you guys don't need a business plan right now. You're still in the process of discovering like how to deliver the right products and who your customers should be and all that kind of stuff. So that the business plan, the, you know, that 30 page document that you spend two weeks writing, that can wait until later on. What, what you need to, the mindset you need to have right now is the discovery mindset. You want to find out as much as you can, test as many assumptions as you can before you write a business plan. And this helps you do that. Um, the first section you work on is your value proposition. And that is, uh, again, the proposition that there's a problem out there and you're solving it. <clears throat> okay? And by go doing that customer discovery work, you have factual input and insights that confirm that you have something unique that you're delivering to those customers that's different from uh, competitive solutions. Be why? Because they told you. You know, we used his interview as an example. Customers told him, you know, they don't like going to a repair shop more than 100 miles away, so, you know, something like that, right? So this, this changes all the time because you're discovering more and more each time you engage with customers. So you're, you're going to kind of change what goes in that box as your business develops. And uh, this is a tool that you can use for years, okay? Not just at the start. You can use this for years. And the way it works is uh, if you want to do it analog, we have printed large-scale canvases for you, and you put Post-it notes on them. You know, as, as you're discovering stuff from your customer, you keep track of what goes in that box with Post-it notes. <clears throat> or... Uh, you can do it digitally, there's, uh, and this is in the assignment on week one, there's a product called Miro, which allows, you, it's, it's basically you, there's a business model canvas template, and you can do digital post-it notes, okay? So what you're after here is, what key activities do our value propositions require our distribution channels, customer relationships, and all that kind of stuff. But the, the, what really goes, needs to go in there right now is what problem are you solving and uh, how is your solution unique based on what the customers told you? That's really what needs to go in that box. Then over here, this is the next box you're gonna work on, which is who are, who are my customer segments? <clears throat> and it's, again, it's, it's, it's age, gender, uh, ethnicity, geographic location, and psychology, psychographics. Uh, that's in particular if it's a business to consumer type company, and I think most of you are B2C, where you're selling to consumers. Um, so you want to really want to laser in on who, who, you, who are your optimal buyers. The way I describe this a lot, whether it's a business to business kind of thing, you guys might end up being B2B. You might find that you make really large sales to businesses that want to celebrate their customers or their employees and stuff, and that you make far more money than trying to sell to individuals. 
you, that might be a discovery that you make. <laughs> right, yeah. And you may end up selling to distributors or wholesalers, <clears throat> although maybe not if you want to have that personal interaction. But <clears throat> the customer segment that you're after is the biggest herd. The, what you want to discover is what is the largest herd of customers that I can capture with the least amount of spend, okay? Who are willing to pay what I need them to pay for my product or service. So what you're after is what's your big herd? And that's where you wanna start. You can, you can expand out from your primary customer segment later on, but you need to discover your primary customer segment. And just think of it like, you know, a Paleolithic hunter out there, you know, with a, with a stone hatchet and a bow and arrow, you're trying to find that big herd of animals that's gonna make the hunting pretty easy, right? Um, and then you gotta figure out where that herd gathers, where that herd, uh, what the herd likes to do, what, what the herd is interested in, um, and figure out how to get in front of that herd as, you know, and with the least amount of spend possible. So that, that's your customer segment piece is getting that defined. <clears throat> um, later on, we're going to talk about the cost of customer acquisition. Okay, so some customers are very expensive to acquire. Um, and if the cost of acquiring the customer exceeds the, the value of the sale, you're in trouble. And a lot, of, a lot of startups don't realize that they're burning way too much money on customer acquisition and it's gonna lead to failure, all right? So uh, we'll, we'll track that, we'll talk about that later on, but that's part of the customer segment analysis. And then the third thing you're gonna work on is customer relationships. So that's like, how do, how do I relate to that big herd of customers? How do I get in front of them? And what do I want that relationship to feel like? What is the, what's the customer journey with my brand? All the touch points. What's their total experience with my brand? Um, you're gonna wanna work on that, map it out, because you wanna support that journey and you want them to keep coming back. So the least expensive, Customer acquisition is a repeat customer. You gotta spend to get them, but you wanna keep them coming back. Uh, you know, and that's part of the customer relationship piece. So we're gonna map that out and figure out what that journey looks like with your customers. This is really, really important. Um, so I'll use my business as an example again. Our community managers, Sarah kicked off tonight, with introductions. Um, every member that uses the Cabrera Center, we have a membership uh, digital card on with 14 customer touch points. And the community managers have to make sure that they check all those boxes over an 18 month period. So we, we have actually mapped out our entire relationship with our customers that we serve here to make sure that we are engaging with them, not forgetting about them, uh, and offering you know, a value that makes them passionate about the Cabarrus Center and about being a Flywheel member. All right, so that's, that's like what customer relationships are about, is mapping all that out and figuring out cost-effective ways to touch them, to engage with them, and to uh, make them champions of your product and repeat, repeat buyers. We'll talk about the rest of it later. But er, what I want to focus on is, is what makes you guys successful, which is this, this customer piece is, is super, super important. So the, the, uh, the data around why businesses fail is very robust. The, the number one reason businesses fail is they, they, they don't find their herd. They don't find, they don't figure out who their customers really are and 
the unit economics don't work on what the customers are willing to pay versus what it costs to acquire them and things like that. The second reason businesses fail is timing. So are, are you too early with your idea, too late with your idea? Uh, what's the cluster of activity around the problem that you're solving? Are there like a gazillion competitors out there that are solving the same problem? Or uh, are there only a few competitors? And how are you gonna differentiate yourself from in terms of your value proposition? So timing is very important. Um, and it, it, it applies to each of you. And then the third reason, third major reason startups fail is the founders don't have the right skill set to execute on their business, okay? Now, I, I can't tell you what those skill sets are. It, it, it varies by, with each of your businesses is gonna have, need a different skill. Like, you guys know how to, need to know how to bake. <laughs> He needs to know how to repair instruments. Um, but you also need to have uh, you know, business skills to, to run a business. You need to know how to do uh, financial forecasting. Uh, because un until you have a basic understanding of uh, a P&L, profit and loss statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement, you don't have the tools necessary to manage a growing business, right? So we're gonna talk about that and you're gonna learn that. You guys are gonna learn, <coughs> that's called a three-part financial, which is just the basic financial instruments that are used to manage businesses. Um, you guys, some of you are already doing that, I'm, I'm sure. If you've been in business for 11 years, you've been filing tax returns and you've had to keep up with your P&L and your balance sheet and stuff like that. But so, for some of you, that's gonna be new, so you guys can share information about that. Um, all right, so the assignment for, for next week is to do a business model canvas on your own business, all right? <clears throat> um, Brittany is gonna bring in large printouts of this canvas, and she's gonna deal out Post-it notes. And We'll pick a few, and you guys can start filling out your canvas. Um, and you're, while you're doing that, you're going to realize uh, this is kind of an assumption on my part. I'm guessing that my primary customer segment is X, Y, and Z. I need to go out and test that with the, with the customer validation techniques that, that you're learning in this class, okay? So you're going to know when you start filling your canvas out, you're going to know where you're guessing and where you're 100% confident because you know that that is a, a true thing that you're putting on the canvas. And if, if you know that you're guessing, that's an assumption that you need to drill down on and, and turn it into a fact, not a guess. Guessing doesn't work in business. <laughs> facts work in business, so you want to deal in facts. Um, there's... Uh, the, there is a really great video course that's assignment number one that you're gonna watch, which tells you how this works, how, how to work with a business model canvas. It's, it's an animated video. It's by Steve Blank, who is the kind of the godfather of this whole methodology of discovering your optimal business. Like, this is how you turn this business into the best thing it can be and help you live your life the way you want to live it. The vision for your success. You know, it's a great tool for kind of getting, figuring out how to do all that stuff. Um, I think that may be all. Let me see if I got anything else to share with you. That's it. Boom. So, so uh, any questions? Uh, about what we're doing here. Now we are gonna get around to like e-commerce and marketing and those, those are really fun classes, but what, what I'm trying to get across to you right now is basic tools for organizing and growing your business, okay? 
this really this is foundational stuff that's really important. Any questions? Did you have a lot of fun tonight? Are you just saying that? I need to test that. Um, so watch, watch those videos. It's on Udacity, which is a learning website. Um, I think there's like eight segments. It might take an hour. It might take a couple hours to watch all the stuff. But watch those videos, because it'll tell you how the business model canvas works. And uh, next week, what we're going to do is pick a couple of volunteers. This is how it's going to work. So everybody's going to get a canvas. And we're going to give all of you time to fill out your post-it notes. So watch the video and be prepared to like start filling your canvas out. And then we're going to pick one of you or two of you. Uh, and so let's say we pick you. You're going to be the victim for the class. Uh, all of us are going to work for her. So you're going to have 10 employees. And we're all going to work on your canvas together. OK? Or we might pick you. Or we might pick you. We're going to pick somebody, uh, one or two of you. And uh, it'll, it'll be a great experience, because it, it basically, we're all going to be on the same team, working on the same business, discussing possible customer segments, possible value propositions, things that we need to test. What are the big assumptions? Most businesses have two or three key assumptions that are foundational, that if those assumptions are false, the business will fail. And that's what you got to figure out with this Canvas tool, is what, what is everything riding on? What's my key assumption where everything is riding, the success of the business is riding on these key assumptions? That's what we want to discover. Those will end up, those assumptions will end up being baked into your financial pro formas, and then you're going to use the scientific method to, to chase those down, to make sure that you are 100% confident that the, your plan, your canvas, is perfect. It's a Mona Lisa. And it's fact-based, and it's going to result in you launching a successful business. Final piece of advice for what it's worth, all early stage businesses overestimate revenue and underestimate expenses. All businesses do that, um, some to great degrees. Uh, so once we get kind of our basic business canvases figured out, and you know, there's work after that, testing out assumptions, but once we get those basic canvases figured out, we're going to move on to developing a financial pro forma that is informed by that canvas. And we're going to see you know, what's the profitability look like, what's the assumption around how much it's going to cost to acquire customers, how much are we going to spend on marketing, what's, how much is going to be spent on insurance, and uh, how much do I have to pay lawyers? Stuff like that. So we're going to, uh, the next step after this, uh, actually next week, we're going to touch on building financial pro formas. But first, you've got to have the canvas. First, we've got to understand, like, what are the ingredients to this business? Then we can start putting numbers to it in terms of a financial pro forma. Those two tools are all you need. Then you go out and talk to customers all the time until you've checked off all your assumptions. And once you got that, you will be so confident in your business. You'll sleep better at night. You'll, you'll know, you know kind of what the upside potential is and what, what your, where your activities ought to be invested. Because the canvas is going to tell you and the pro form is going to tell you, OK? And then you're all going to be part of the retail lab store. And we're going to sell a crap load of product. <laughs> and we're all going to be happy, right? OK, all right. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, so stick with us. You'll learn a lot. And uh, next week, we'll, we'll have fun with the, with the canvases, OK? Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right, take care.